Is your show? Oh, I can't speak anymore. Well, we're doing great right now. <laughs> is your we, phone charged enough? Because mine's at 100%. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. I would just make sure the iPad stays charged in. I was denominating. You're going to intro again because I need to keep your focus as long as possible. <laughs> Who would know? Back to the Christ and Culture. This is Gordon and Clint, and time has passed. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is part two of our two part episode on Chernobyl. So if you didn't listen to last week's episode, make sure you go back and listen to that one. If you haven't seen the show, you can go do that because it's really good. Yeah, otherwise, we're giving a pretty good synopsis too. So if you don't want to watch it, yeah, and it's up to you. I didn't know how it would go, so now having done the first three episodes of this. Clint's kind of just running through everything because it is, it's all one big major theme. Yeah. And so if you had listened to that last week's episode and you're like, I want to go watch it and I didn't finish it, I probably wouldn't listen to this podcast until you finish watching it or go and watch it because it'll probably ruin the show. Yeah. If we, we haven't already. We probably should have said that at the beginning. Spoiler alerts, but we'll do it this time. Yep. Spoiler alert. I just realized I meant to put that in the show notes for this last podcast that came out for it. Oh, we can go back and do that. Yeah. Oh, well. Well, it is what it is. Sorry, guys. Hope you uh, didn't ruin anything. (laughs) Anyways, I know not much time has passed for us necessarily, but it is another week in podcast time. So what other uh, media have you been taking in, if any? Uh, I had seen two Netflix movies, one called Paddleton. I heard something about that, knowing yeah. what it is. It's Ray Romano. Yeah. Ray oh. Romano. And He's forget, still acting? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I forget the other guy. I didn't think he was. But, And it's a movie that like me and Lizzie wanted to see, but we never got around to it. And then I forgot it was on there, because by the time it was like present on Netflix, now it's like you have to go find it. And Davis actually saw it. Shout out to Davis. And recommended Shout it to out. me. He's like, I watched this movie, and it seemed very much like a Gordon movie. Mm-hmm. And it's actually really good. I actually might do a podcast on it because it's interesting because it's about these two guys. One gets diagnosed with cancer, but like terminal. So we know he's going to die. And he finds out that, you know, he can, you know, kind of be treated in order to like slow it down or try to, you know, all these things and just go until he dies. Or he could actually, there's actually like a legal way for him to like, essentially can kill himself but assisted suicide yeah and that's what he wants to do because he doesn't want to like get all bloated and all that stuff and Mm. that's the whole movie the whole movie's up until you know him and they're both friends they've been friends forever and they're both like a little later than middle-aged men uh that just all they have is each other and they play this game called paddleton which is kind of like wall ball mixed with racquetball and yeah, it's just Ray Romano's like, they don't ever like share their feelings. And so it's interesting. It's good. Hmm. It's really good. It's, but it's like very monotone, very sad, but very Ray Romano. <laughs> <laughs> Ray okay. Romano tone. Yeah. Oh, Romano toned. Oh, that's good. Dang. Look at you. Okay. So you said you had two. So what's the other one? Oh, the other one was a, another Netflix movie. Oh, interview with God. Oh. Which I actually didn't finish because I fell asleep, so I need to finish it. But it is a, what do you call it? Someone that writes for the newspaper. Journalist. Okay. Journalist who went to war to journal the war. And Which came, war? Don't Sorry. Ask me that. <laughs> it was modern, so it could have been like the Afghanistani war. Okay. Um, or the war in Iraq or something. Yeah. It, or, yeah. And I'm not sure which one, but we have a dog. Woof, woof. <laughs> He comes back and, you know, he doesn't have as much PTSD as other people, but he he still deals with it. And he actually now helps out with soldiers that deal with PTSD and try to get them help and connections. Hmm. And he goes, someone writes in saying that they're God and he he wants to interview them. And, you know, essentially it is God, but he has five interviews with God, no, three interviews with God. And each time 
he gets to ask whatever he, whatever he wants and he's trying to figure out like why god wants like has appeared to this and all this stuff it's really interesting hmm. it's really good really well done because a lot of stuff they talk about like or a lot of the ways the, the character the guy that plays god answers the questions are i think are really well done but i never got to the third interview so i don't know okay most of the spoilers are how it ends is it but the first two answers are actually pretty yeah decent yes cool i think so i appreciate that because yeah. a lot of the times they are not no i know and i mean there might be a few things but i think it was really well done okay and like the journalist isn't an atheist he is actually like religious and that's okay. why he took on this interview because he's like interested huh. okay interesting yeah yeah i've definitely not heard of that one i know danny watched it i think a while back before she was on and that was one of the ones she might have done with us because hmm. it had like the science and the you know reason over faith kind of conversation sure, sure. but uh we wouldn't go with that so what about you did you have you seen anything else in two minutes I haven't seen anything else that I didn't already mention. Like I said, the last couple weeks have been pretty busy, but I always listen to stuff. So I've, well, Tea with Tolkien is back. So I've mentioned that on here before. And Caitlin is back with uh, a lot of awesome new episodes. If you haven't gone back and uh, listened to any of her stuff yet and you have any interest in Tolkien whatsoever, go check her stuff out. It's great. They did an episode with, um, who was it? It was her husband and Matt Baker from hmm. Roman Circus and it was basically her reading the first chapter of the Silmarillion and them oh I who, saw this tweet who had never read any of it before just like commentary and questions and stuff and it was hilarious and actually really insightful and good and a good uh, reminder and that's actually what made me go back and start listening to um, the Silmarillion audiobook again so I've been refreshing some of that stuff and walking through it with Davis as well so shout out to Davis again Nice. And then I finished the book that Chris gave me back in like April. Okay. Uh, so I only had a couple pages left and I finally just finished it. So it was uh, Not a Tame Lion. Right. I don't remember who the author is, but phenomenal book. Basically just goes through biography and philosophy of C.S. Lewis. So very, very good. Big mm. fan. So if you guys haven't realized it at this point from our ramblings before, this is part two of our chernobyl episode so let's go ahead and dive in so we're starting with episode four this time right so is there anything you think we need to say or do before we, we dive in or should we just go for it previously on a nuclear line <laughs> <laughs> dun, 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 dun. a nuclear plant in chernobyl blew up or well, the core blew up mm -hmm. people most people that were in charge of it or kind of say, denying that there's anything wrong and it's not a big deal, even though all these other people that are like know what they're talking about and are professionals are saying this is worse than the nuclear bomb on Hiroshima. And the things they're trying to do to fix the problem are making it worse. Some people are trying to or sacrifice their lives to fix it. And yeah, now most people are like in the hospital dying and like the main problem is fixed. And it's this aftermath of, you know, kind of like the Hiroshima bomb, but sure, for months and stuff even today there's still places that have a radiation oh yeah oh yeah. yeah so you can officially i looked this up because after i watched the show i was just obsessed with chernobyl for like two weeks and looked up stuff all the time but you can actually go tour it now and it's actually a pretty common tourist destination but obviously you can't go in certain areas and even if you are in the parts that are okay to tour you're still getting pretty serious amounts of that, radiation that was in dark tourist Oh, was the it? The show I was talking about. He didn't go to Chernobyl. He goes to uh, Japan or China. And he goes to places where they do tours of places that are radioactive. And they they give everyone a little device that tracks radiation. Mm -hmm. And he's like, what's like the healthy amount of... of what's the, How high can we go, right? And I think the guy's like 0. 0.8. And they're like, okay. And then they f get to these places eventually and they're like 8. Mm-hmm over eight times the amount he said was like and he's like should we leave and the guy's like it's okay and he's like we're all really uncomfortable we're gonna leave and like <laughs> just the more they walk the higher it was getting and there's places that are like it's it's a crazy and he's like yeah this is what we allow but if you want to go further it's fine yeah and i mean we talked about this on last week's episode but they said 3.6 was the equivalence of 400 x-rays and we worry about like x-rays causing cancer and stuff that's why we have the lead coverings right. on us right 
and we have like the doctors won't even stand in the same room and 3.6 <laughs> yeah. is the equivalent of 400 times that and you're right. saying they're walking casually through an eight yes yeah and then this what they measured on the outside not the nuclear core itself on the outside was over 15,000 and so like it's just absolutely insane but I think that's a pretty good summary 30 yeah. second summary of what went down so where we open in, in episode four is actually about four months after everything went down. So it's August 1986. We see Sherbina and Lagasev are they're still trying to figure out how to close off the reactor itself because anyone who gets close just dies. And the new workers, they I remember I said they were getting like 750,000 workers or whatever. They have arrived and many of them are actually only teenagers. And so we are introduced to this new character named, I think it's... Pavel is how you pronounce it, but he's a young kid, maybe like 15, 16. He looks really young and he gets assigned to quote unquote animal control. And so their job is to go around and find any animals that are alive, kill them, and then wow. they get rid of them. And so his job is to literally go through the cities to hunt and hunt dogs and cats basically that are left behind. And you see him and the kind of people that are with him really struggle with that especially at first for him because it's their pets right you know and they just like literally want to come up and play with you but they're reactive they're nuclear you know they have contamination and so they have to get rid of them and so going back to Sherbina and Lagasev they bring in a moon rover to help clear the roof so they can push all of the the stone that I've been talking about the graphite push it back into the reactor so that they can cover it up because otherwise they have all this nuclear graphite all over the place and so they're trying to get it back in but no one can touch it so they bring in this moon rover to clear the roof that's got to be expensive it is and they get it from like germany or something they have to that's that's the big thing they actually have to oh no hold on i think this one is actually from them but anyways i'll, I'll spoil it eventually they get one from germany and they have to convince the USSR officials to go to Germany for help, which is like a huge slap in the face for them. Right. You know, Cause it's totally. the cold war. And we find out later on, I think this is later this episode or the next one, but we find out that they actually downplayed the severity of how bad it was. And so as soon as they put the, the German Rover up there, it breaks down because it can't handle the radiation because they told the, Germans that it only had to be, I don't know what the number was, but say it's like 5,000. But the real number is over 15,000 because they didn't want it to look as bad as it really was. And so they're still covering up all this stuff. And so the rover goes up to try and clear the roof. Obviously, like I just said, that doesn't really work. We have Yulana, who is that physicist who works for the nuclear facility. She goes back to Dyatlov, who is still in the hospital in Moscow, and says that she found a document saying that there was an issue with what is called the AZ-5 or AZ-5 button, which is supposed to shut down the reactor, but instead caused the explosion. And so she found a document that actually mentioned this being an issue in plants like this before, but was covered up and had redacted in the file. So she'd been doing some digging, essentially. Uh, he basically doesn't give her any information, and he says, you think... The right question will get you the truth. All it will get you is more lies. And I will get the bullet. And that's all he says to her. And so, again, covering up the asking questions. You don't need to ask questions because you're not going to get the truth. So why bother kind of thing. But even a hint that, like, there's more powerful forces at work here. Yeah. Which sure. I kind of assumed in the last episodes with the KB KGB stepping in and... Like, yeah, just like the, the military also being like seeming like they know what's going on. Yeah. And th I, I don't know if they even know what's going on. They probably, I they think, know what to protect. So like they know if someone's digging, that's not allowed. Yeah, exactly. Like they've been told that they don't know what, why, but they're, but, and, but they're willing to protect or listen to their authority, which it, we talked about that last, yeah, last episode, the authority figure. And it's all about the perception, the blind faith of yeah. man. They, 
especially because it is the Cold War, like I just mentioned. Yeah, when the, you said that, I was like, I didn't even make that connection. Yeah. It's the Cold War, which that's kind of what this whole thing is about. Exactly. And so if anything shows like a weakness for the USSR, they're ruined. And actually, I'm going to do another spoiler. At the end of the show, they're kind of going into like post-credit facts and stuff. And maybe if we have time, I can mention some of them. One of them actually says that they, many people believe that this is the start of the downfall of the USSR. Hmm. And it's 1986 to 1988, 89. That's right before they like really started to collapse, you know? And so we see like this weakness. Uh, so it actually makes sense. Like it actually was a huge part of the Soviet Russia Something collapse. Something I don't think we mentioned last episode that I think is actually crucial now realizing this bigger connection mm-hmm. is when it comes to, we talked about like, the denial of truth and almost believing your own truth and like hoping that will like be true or not even realizing that you're not doing anything wrong, but the power of asking for help. Mm. Mm -hmm. Like this whole thing is, is out of pride. It's because they can't ask for help because you you said it would show weakness. Yeah. And we, and that's a modern thing still. Like if, if I ask for help for this ridiculous thing that only I'm, only I'm dealing with. Yeah. Then People are going to know that I'm weak, I'm I, I'm messed up, like I'm ugly, like right. internally, like I'm, I'm not. It's that isolation that we were talking about in the last episode. And I think that's especially true for like addictions and especially like sexual addictions too. I think especially of like pornography and masturbation, like people don't want to talk about that. Like, because no. it's, it's hard to, hard to admit, but as soon as you are willing to do that, you realize I'm not the only one struggling with this. And like, I, I can't get help. There's a lot of people who can and, and want to help me with this, you know? And so I just think it's really, really important that we, we realize and like, we let go of that pride first off and admit that we need help. Yeah. Like I you're was saying, listening to a really fascinating podcast today from the art of manliness podcast. Yeah. And they're talking about bigorexia and it's basically a what bigorexia. I will explain. Okay, please do. But uh, it was talking about basically eating disorders for men and how men fall into those same disorders just just as easily and as frequently. But the shame comes f- when seeking help with that in that those disorders seem like feminine disorders. Mm. And bigorexia is the same kind of thing, but with muscle mass. So it's oh yeah steroids and and wanting to the, the get quick muscles or or just in the mind like there he's talking about how like when there's like a like like last week the the storm and if because of that storm your local gym that you go to shut down someone that has this problem goes into anxiety attack almost falls into depression there's even like suicide rates that people with anorexia or bulimia twenty five percent of them commit suicide mm. because 50 percent of them the half of them have like depressed no i don't know i don't know the stats but 25 percent commit suicide and the other half that's something that only really could apply to women and so for for this for these men it's either it's they're just stuck in this isolation or they're or they actually you know, their own life is taken mm. and it was, it was really interesting mm. but same kind of thing like yeah. just asking for help is powerful coming coming back to this pavel the, the young kid and the group that he's with, I don't know that they have a huge part to play in this. And maybe I just kind of overlooked them. I, th- I thought it was interesting. So I'll kind of briefly mention their stuff. But the first time they go out, the, the leader of their little trio, his name is Bacho. And he says he has two rules. Number one, don't aim at me. Number two, if you shoot something, don't let it suffer. He, you can tell like he's hardened by what they do and he's a soldier he was a soldier before this he's hardened but he still doesn't like to see people suffer and so he gets really really good at what he does essentially and as soon as pavel shoots his first dog he can't finish it and he gets caught by bacho and you see him just suffering and bacho comes in and has to finish the job and he's kind of like walking him through it and is like telling him how everyone struggles their first kill and stuff like that and then behind them up on a wall, there's a Russian banner and they start talking about it a little bit and kind of laugh because it says our goal is the happiness of all mankind. That's what it says in Russian. And it's kind of like this propaganda, obviously, but 
I thought this was kind of one of the bigger things that I noticed with, with that kind of group because obviously that's not their goal. Like we were just talking about, their goal is prideful cover-ups and stuff like that. Because if it was actually the happiness of all mankind, they would have taken care of the hundreds of thousands of people that have been affected already at this point. So with that, we jump into September of that year. And that's where the German situation that I was just talking about with the German uh, moon rover and here's the numbers. So it's 2,000 units is what they told the Germans that they needed it to be capable to withstand, not 20,000 like they should have, and that's why. And so because of that, they realize that there are no robots on Earth capable of doing what they need to do, and they realize that they need to start using people. So in October, soldiers are brought in, and they're, they're told to clear the roof, and they have 90 seconds at a time. They only allow 90 seconds of exposure. They have to get as much over the rail and into the core in those 90 seconds, and then they're done. They're gone. And from what I understood, they never used the same people more than once. So they're going through tons and tons of people uh, just in those 90 seconds to get as much done as possible. That's insane. And this is where we go back to Mrs. Ignatenko. So her husband is dead, but we realized in earlier in episode four she was pregnant. And so she goes into labor at this point. And we'll come back to that in a little bit because so, that's actually the last time that we, we see her. So December, we have Ulana, Sherbina, and Legasov, And they meet because Legasov is being sent to Vienna to explain to the world what happened. And Legasov recognizes the report that Ulana was talking about before, the one that was covered up. And he was actually part of the incident years ago, so he explains it. So he actually was, I don't think he was directly involved in it, but he knew about it, or at least he knew the people who were in charge of it. He explains that when the button was pressed to shut everything down, there was an energy spike, not a shutdown like it was supposed to happen. Later, he goes into why that's the case. Because the information was redacted, they didn't know that this was going to happen again, right. essentially. Ulana tells him to go public, despite the fact that the USSR would kill him and all of his family and everything. Shabina tells him to make a deal with the KGB to keep the information out of the report in exchange for letting him go and fix the rest of the reactors who are built the same way. And so he's stuck in this dilemma. And eventually, well, actually, let's go through this first. Shabina says to Ulana, when it's your life or the lives of those you love, your moral conviction doesn't mean anything. It leaves you. And all you want at that moment is not to be shot. And Ulana responds, Do you know the name Vasily Ignatenko? Shabina says no. He was a fireman. He died two weeks after the incident. I've been looking in on his widow. She gave birth. A girl. The baby lived for four hours. They say the radiation would have killed the mother, but the baby absorbed it instead. Her baby. We live in a country where children have to die to save their mothers. To hell with your deal, and to hell with our lives, someone has to start telling the truth. Let's go ahead and stop there. Found our Christ figure. <laughs> His baby. Yeah. But also, I mean, uh, I think Steve would have a lot to say on this too, because like, this is the reason uh, reasoning the that people give death. for yeah. abortion mm -hmm. to save the mother. Mm -hmm. And here we are, this is 1986. And this is like disgusting to her, you know, not in the same context, but in, in this way, like the baby absorbed all of the, the radiation that would have killed the mother. So yes, we have the Christ figure. We also have this baby who's dying because uh, essentially the mother chose to right. like hug and, and kiss right, her husband when she wasn't supposed to. We saw that throughout episodes like one through three, right? So what are your thoughts on the all of that going on? I don't know. Uh, one thing that stood out earlier was, I know you said it was like a minor thing, or you thought maybe it might have been a minor thing, was the rules that he gave to Pavel. Yeah, please. Because he said, if you shoot something, don't let it suffer. And I was just thinking about this whole situation. 
And that, like, in the beginning, when they didn't evacuate the town, like, essentially this mm. button was mm-hmm. the shot, right? Yeah. And rather than, I don't know, either executing the town or letting them leave, like, these people are here suffering because they're ultimately taking in all this radiation. And, like, it's, it's just the irony of the situation. Yeah. The irony of that one line, don't let people just suffer and die slowly. But, like either end it yeah. or don't do it at all and i'm sure it's done intentionally and i just didn't pick up on it yeah and then i mean just that one last line it's true i didn't pick up on the the kind of the message of the abortion but it's totally true but how i also saw it too was just we live in a country where children have to die to save their mothers or where this one child you know i was thinking of like mary and, and jesus mm. um mm. and then someone has to start telling mm. the truth and that would be the, jesus who came it's yeah. just like Look, God has been talking to you guys, and you've had prophets, but here I am. Yeah. I am the way and the truth and the life. Yeah, and I mean, that also comes down to us, too, right? As Christians, we are supposed to tell the truth, the, the good news, right? Right. And that's what we're told to do by Christ. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly it. And I, I think this is really just a call to mission in a lot of different ways. On, on both of those fronts, first off, so the, the abortion front, it says to hell with your deal. And I mean, this is like something that I feel it could be said to like yeah. politics, po- yeah. uh, politicians to hell with your deal and to hell with our lives. Someone has to start telling the truth. Now, I, I think that fits. And then same thing with like the cover ups in the church right now to hell with it. Someone needs to start telling the truth. Who cares what happens to us? We need to come out with it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. God, Jesus says you have to die to, we have to die to ourselves. You know, we have to, like our our life isn't even of of that value, right? It it really comes to shout truth. out to Luna for the background <laughs> sound effects. It really comes down to the truth. Yeah, and so just the last note I have here for episode four is the number of soldiers that were used to clear the roof. So three thousand eight hundred twenty-eight, each of them for ninety seconds. So just kind of mind-blowing that 4,000 people were exposed to that much that much radiation. All right, so the final episode, episode five, it starts out by showing the town outside Chernobyl, the one that we were talking about in episode one that we couldn't pronounce, 12 hours before the explosion and showing the normal lives of all the people that died. You see the leadership of Chernobyl. We go inside of a meeting with them. The leadership of Chernobyl believe that they will each be promoted when this test runs well, that includes Dyatlov. They are pushing the plant too hard because they need to reach some quota to impress their superiors. And when asked if that would make it unstable to run the test, Dyatlov says no, because he was just promised a promotion if it went correctly, essentially. So then we go to March 1987. The KGB take Lagasev and thank him for lying at the conference in Vienna and offer him a promotion if he testifies at the trial against Dyatlov and the others. Legasov asks why nothing has been done about the other reactors and because they had a deal. Right. And the leader of the KGB says, first the trial. Once it's over, we will have our villains, we will have our heroes, we will have our truth. After that, we can deal with the reactors. Thoughts on that? I think this kind of ties back to that opening quote from episode one. Yeah, because the heroes were forgotten. And, I mean, really, he's this is all fluff. Because yeah. in, the, in, the first, in the first quote from last episode, he said, all that really matters is who's to blame. Mm-hmm. And so in this sense, you're like, we're just digging to figure out where we can stick this problem. Yeah. And then we'll have our truth right that's what he says right and stories yeah and i mean that's a phrase that gets thrown around today too. tell your truth right no truth is truth because when you think about it they can't go start fixing these reactors because then there's like this thing that we knew about and and we're fixing but if we figure out oh someone's to blame look they they knew about this button thing now we've got to go fix the rest of these reactors yeah it makes more sense you just hit at the heart of episode five. <laughs> That's exactly it. Okay, and so next we have Ulana, right? And she meets with Lagasov and tells him to tell the truth at the trial 
because there will be other scientists there who work at the other facilities, essentially. And she says, you told me to find out what happened. I spoke to dozens of people. Every word they said I wrote down all in these books. And then she grabs and says, these are the ones that are alive. There's one book. And these are the ones that are dead. And there's this massive stack. They died rescuing each other, putting out fires, tending to the wounded. They didn't hesitate. They didn't waver. They simply did what had to be done. And then Lagasse says, so have I. I went willingly to an open reactor, so I have already given my life. Isn't that enough? And Ulana says, no. I'm sorry, but it's not. And that's kind of the end of the scene. So we have this this call to sacrifice more. Right. So Lagasse has been the hero. Without him, essentially all of Europe would have blown up. Right. But he's called to give more. And for the record, like most of these characters are, are real people, with the exception Ulana actually is like a combination of like twenty different scientists put into like one person. But for the most part, this stuff is like pretty accurate. It's kind of when like Jesus foreshadows his disciples martyrdom. Yeah. And then one of them's like, exactly. What about him? And he's like, Don't like look, everyone's giving to their fullest ability. Yeah. So even though you, for you it might seem like you're giving more than someone else you're not like to to be, to bear the king the keys to the kingdom is just as big of a of like of a sacrifice mm-hmm. than than to be crucified upside down yeah and it might not seem that way but if you trade places you would you would hate it yeah it's crazy uh and he i mean he even tells them like none of you will like survive essentially except for right. john right yeah and that's what happens so we get to July of that year, and it's back at Chernobyl, ironically. So as they drive to the, this trial, they see the graveyard of machines that were used to like partially evacuate it from the cities, but also the ones that were used to clear all this stuff and to do all the aftermath. And Lagasov is reminded of all the people who died using them to save everyone. Sherbina is called to testify first. So we're going to go through the trial I thought this stuff was really, really, really exciting. Hopefully, it kind of translates to this. But if not, go watch the show because it it actually explains like how the reactor works exactly, mm-hmm. and it mm-hmm. walks through like what happened. So I'll do my best. So Shabin is first. He says that all three of the people on trial, so that's Diatlov and the two people above him who were kind of like calling the shots, were given awards for finishing the completion of the building early, but it wasn't actually done. So that was their first issue. They wanted to like look so good that they rushed it and made it look like they were done with all the safety stuff when in reality it wasn't. It had not been fully tested. He then goes on to explain that the test that was being performed that night that we just heard about at the beginning of this episode, he like walks through it. So they tried it three times and failed all three times. The fourth test was the explosion. And so then Ulana comes up And she's going to explain some more. So she explains that the test was supposed to happen the day before, but they were told to wait to keep the uh, output of energy uh, up for a few more hours. Because in order to do the test, they would have to lower the output of energy. Mm -hmm. But some powerful company called and was like, we need it for a few more hours. Can you postpone? And that's where we saw that interview or that kind of commentary at the beginning of this episode. Realistically, the answer was no. Right. But they wanted this powerful company and they wanted the test both done. And so they stretched it. She then explains that there's a shift change at midnight. So the crew that was operating during the test was not the crew that was trained to do the test. Okay. And so it was given to them or they were given the instructions to like complete the task literally minutes before they're supposed to perform the the whole test and so that's why we have those two scientists who we talked about last episode right saying i did everything right i did everything right because they're going through right yeah and they probably did and the other thing is in the notes they were given some of it was redacted and some of it was like changed and they asked the and they're like are you stupid just do what it says and he's just like calling them out and stuff 
yeah, so th- these guys call someone for help and they're told to do the instructions, even the ones that have been crossed out, just do them anyways. Dyatlov comes in and asks if they're ready. Some of them lie and say yes, because they want to look good in front of Dyatlov. And then those who tell the truth are just like ripped to shreds by Dyatlov, just completely tears into him. So that's the end of Ulana's testimony. Legasov comes up. He says, only two things happen at a reactor. Either energy levels are going up or they're going down. The control room's job is to make sure that stays balanced. Dyatlov tried to force them to go faster and he just left, left the control room. And he told them when they were ready for him to come get him because they were going too slow. He got bored essentially. And that's when the issue happened, when he wasn't even in the control room. The engineer wants to shut it down. So this is the one that pressed the button. But Dyatlov tells him not to do it and to just give it more power and that would override the situation. The engineers are like, that's too dangerous with how unstable it is right now. And then we flash back to the trial again. Dyatlov claims that he wasn't even in the room, so that wasn't possible. And so we have another lie covering up all this Mm -hmm. stuff. And that brings a big fight in the trial. And they call a recess. And so what we see next, I think is pretty big. So we have Sherbina walks out and tells... Essentially, Sherbina actually is the one that convinces the judge to not shut down the trial right there, essentially. Sherbina walks out and... They sit down, he and Legasov, and Sherbina starts telling him the history of Chernobyl. So this is what he says. Sherbina. It was mostly Jews and Poles. The Jews were killed in the revolution, and Stalin forced the Poles out. Then the Nazis came in and killed whoever was left. But after the war, people came to live here anyway. They knew the ground beneath their feet was soaked in blood, but they didn't care. Dead Jews, dead Poles, but not them. Nobody ever thinks it's going to happen to them. And now here we are. And he shows that he is also coughing up blood from their time at Chernobyl. And then he goes on. I know you told me, and I believed you, but time passed, and I thought, maybe it won't happen to me. And I wasted it. I wasted it all for nothing. I'm an inconsequential man. I hoped that someday I would matter, but I didn't. I just stood next to people that did. And Legasov responds, There are other scientists like me. Any one of them could have done what I did, but you got us what we needed. Men, resources, even lunar rovers. They heard me, but they listened to you. Of all the ministers and all the deputies, obedient fools, they mistakenly sent the one good man. For God's sake, Boris, you were the one that mattered most. Thoughts on this conversation? I think there's a lot going on here. Uh, I mean, I think it comes down to that desire to like leave your mark and to be something before you in the face of death. Uh, I mean, that kind of came up in our like death dinner. We had a young adult group, like you know, just just he's dying, mm-hmm. and like you were reading that last line, and I was like nodding my head because I was like agreeing with Legas- Leg- Legasov. 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 I was like, yes, like, Shrabina, you've done everything, mm-hmm. even with Legasov, like, even with, like, the calling him out. And, like, what do you mean you've done nothing? And it's just, like, this idea of what, what we see about ourselves versus what others the see. truth. And it goes back to truth. Yeah. What's true? And sometimes we don't believe, like, we, we can't see truth. We don't even believe it. And I think it goes back to like the challenge you, you gave for the people last week. Like, what are the lies that we're, we're believing? Yeah. But yeah. Well, I think that even goes back to the opening quote from episode one, right? When you believe lies so much, you stop seeing the truth. And that includes right. the way we see ourselves. Yeah. When we start believing all these false identities of who we are and who we're supposed to be, we don't see who we actually are. And ultimately, especially for us as Christians, like that's children of God. And th- the other thing I wanted to bring up from that conversation was what he was saying about people moving to this area even though they knew it was bloody ground everyone would say it's not going to happen to me and people have said that in every generation in in every place i think Uh, it's not going to happen to me i know for myself in high school that was kind of something that i just kind of thought we were invincible you know especially because 
like I was, I was in martial arts. I was a fighter and stuff. And I kind of always just imagined my, me and my friends as being like, you know, too, too tough to be hurt, like seriously hurt, you know? And then after I graduated, one of my friends who I wrestled with actually passed away like the day before I went to college. And it was just like earth shattering to me that like we can actually be, we can be broken. Like we're not invincible. And I think that's important for us to remember and to rem- remember that. Like, I mean, it's kind of the memento mori kind of thing that we talked about a couple weeks ago on the live episode, but just remember that things can happen to us. Right. And so it's, even more important for us to be able to stand up and do what is right, knowing that we don't know the day or the hour. And it's not even just like our death, but like you don't know what's going to happen to you. You don't know 20 years ago, 30 years ago, if we talked about the state of our country right now that uh, certain situations would be happening, no one would believe it. People would Mm -hmm. be saying, oh, it's not going to happen here. Yeah. You know, and it is. And that's just how things go. And so to not be blind to, to that truth. So they go back to the trial. And we see that these engineers kept telling Dyatlov it wasn't safe. And it just kept getting worse because he was trying to keep going. None of the other employees actually at the reactor even know that there's a test going on. So other than the people in the control room, no one else knew because it was a different shift. So they're doing this test. None of the employees knew. And they want to go tell them, but Dyatlov says not to bother, everything's fine. Another mistake. The computer records say to shut down. Dyatlov again says, no, keep going. The test starts, and the power shoots up with nothing left to stop it. And if you go watch the the show, it explains like the chemical balances and stuff. It's crazy stuff. Then Logosov explains the AZ5 button. This is the key. So essentially what the AZ5 does, I'll try to explain it as best as I can. There is something within the nuclear rods that they, this whole process of preparing for the test, they pull them out to lower the power. And then what the button does that they just hit shoots it back in and it's supposed to balance it out again. But the USSR people, when they're making them, they actually used a type of uh, metal, I believe, that the instant it touches actually skyrockets instead of balances it out, the power. And so it does the opposite of what it's supposed to. Whereas like in the U.S., they used a different material because it was safer. But in the USSR, it was all about efficiency and right. cheap yeah. and stuff like that because of the, I mean, communist kind of way of, of doing things, right. I guess. And because of that, it skyrocketed the power and that's what blew it up. So with that being said, that was the point that was redacted. That was everything that shows that it's the government's fault because they knew about this. And he says that. And so they try to end the trial right there again. And Sherbina says, no, let him finish. So this is Sherbina sacrificing himself. Legasov explains that the issue was caused because, like I said, unlike the West, They use what is cheaper rather than what is safer. And so it went 10 times the capacity that it was supposed to go to. The judge says, you're trotting on dangerous ground. And Legasov replies, I've already trod on dangerous ground. We're on dangerous ground right now because they're at Chernobyl, at least the town next to it. They are practically what define us because of our secrets and our lies. When the truth offends me, we lie and lie until it isn't even there but it is. It's still there. Every lie that we tell incurs a debt to the truth. Sooner or later, that debt is paid. That is how the RBMK reactor core explodes. Lies. So the RBMK reactor is the type of reactor that Chernobyl was, essentially. Okay. So they're trying to figure out, like, how does it explode? No one knows. Like, that's the whole show. And he said, how does the reactor explode? Lies. That's what causes it. So the KGB arrest him right there. They throw him in a room and the KGB leader who we had been talking to before comes in and says, I can do anything I want with you, but what I want most is for you to know that I know that you're not brave. You're not heroic. You're just a dying man who forgot himself. Legasov says, I know who I am. I know what I've done. 
In a just world, I would be shot for my lives, but not for this, not for the truth. KGB uh, leader says, scientists and your obsessions. When a bullet hits your skull, what will it matter? Why? Essentially, in the end, they, they reject his testimony altogether from the trial, and they take away his job, but he's allowed to live because they want him to see all of his success given credit to other people and for him to live completely alone, realizing that like, it's that don't let the person suffer right. kind of thing. And they're letting him suffer. Yeah. He's not allowed to speak to Sherbina or Ulana ever again. He's isolated and the KGB follow him for the rest of his life. He asks what would happen if he refused to comply. And the le- KGB leader says, why worry about something that is never going to happen? And so again, we have, it's impossible, right? This rejection of reality. And essentially, this is the last scene before, I believe it's about a year after this, when we see that opening scene, right. when he's in his apartment, yeah, and he's like, I'm finally going to get everything out. And he records the tapes. Yeah, and it's the KGB who are watching him from the street the whole time. And the last line of the show... I want to say this uh, before we kind of move on here, but this is uh, Legasov again. He says, To be a scientist is to be naive. We are so focused on our search for truth, we fail to consider do we actually want to find it. But it is always there, whether we see it or not, whether we choose to or not. The truth doesn't care about our needs or our wants doesn't care about our governments, our ideologies, our religions. It will lie in wait for all time. And this, at last, is the gift of Chernobyl, where I once were to fear the cost of truth. Now only I ask, what is the cost of lies? And that is the end of the recordings that we talked about at the beginning. So I don't know that this is a perfect quote. There's some stuff that doesn't really um, (laughs) make that much sense. But with everything that kind of happened here at the end, there's a lot of kind of details I threw in. What are your thoughts? I know it's a lot. I mean, in the end, nothing changed. That's the craziest part. Like, even in the end, when the truth was plainly, blatantly laid out, like, even those same people, his testimony was removed, and he was just, like you said, like, left to to suffer, mm-hmm. and... And he's he's saying like to that just it's all naivety uh, that that their their goal as their job as scientists is to find truth, but for them that means like cutting corners, doing this, like doing all these things in order to get to that truth sooner. And like I said, it's not even seeking truth at that point. It's it's lying and causing problems the cost of lies rather than at the cost of seeking truth but they're so blind to it they're so naive and like and it's yeah i don't know let me throw this in real quick and see what you think so after the actual show part is over they list a bunch of facts and stuff uh like post script fact essentially so the first one says that after his suicide exactly two years after the explosion these tapes were recorded with his testimony and they were circulated to the USSR scientific community, and they used it. The scientific community took those tapes, and they pressured the government and forced them to acknowledge that the flaws in the design of the reactor needed to be fixed. And the 16 remaining reactors that had that same design were finally fixed to prevent it from ever happening again. So it wasn't until after his death. Right. But eventually, after that death, I don't want to glorify his his suicide because that's not where he was the hero. The hero was when he was at the trial, knowing that he would have been killed, even though he wasn't, and he did what was right anyways. That's where he was the hero. And because of his work and because of his sacrifice, they were able to get the truth to people who were able to make a difference in the end. So does that change anything at all? I mean, you know, it, I think it does, but I think what really encap- encapsulates what's going on here is the line where he's talking to the KGB official and he says, 
I know who I am and I know what I've done. Yeah. In a just world, I would be shot for my lies and not for this, not for the truth. Yeah. Like where he's living, he's saying like, this isn't just this whole town, this whole, this whole system that's been built here is, is the opposite of what is true and what should be. You guys should all be the ones that are technically being punished or suffering or shot because of that. But it goes back to what we know in scripture where it's like, you know, sometimes the people that lie and people that do this or that get away with it. Yeah. But in the end, there is a final judgment. And so it, it, it is this moment of he had to sacrifice in that moment, even talking back to him, he knew he could die again. Mm hmm. And in the end, he still chooses to tell the truth. Yeah. Even, even though, like you say, he took, took his own life. Right. Yeah. I, I think that's it. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, at, at the end, they have all these facts, which are really interesting and stuff. I'm not going to go through them because they're not really pertinent to like what we're talking about. But I, I hope you guys got something out of it other than just the fact that this is a really awesome show. The truth needs to come out. And so before, before we go into challenges... Actually, no, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and go into challenges. I have one. If Great. You... I, do, I don't. So this is actually what I was thinking about to do this episode from the very beginning as soon as I saw episode five. Okay. So Ulana's testimony on kind of what I thought was kind of a testimony on abortion, essentially. For those of you who aren't aware, the day after we are recording actually starts the first day of the 40 Days for Life movement. So... My challenge for you is over these next 40 days or after, whenever you're listening to this, in some way, stand up for truth in the pro-life movement. Like there are, uh, Steve would have the exact numbers, but there's like so many people, like so many babies that are being killed every single year and it's, it's ridiculous and we're just not doing enough. And so my challenge for you is to stand up for truth Participate in the 40 Days for Life. Speak out. Stand up for life. Um, just, was it last week or two weeks ago, there was so-called doctor who performed abortions that had over 2,000 yeah. babies were found in his backyard. Over 2,000. So my challenge for you is to do something and not say that we, we just can't do anything because who are we, but to actually go out and, and stand for truth, no matter yeah. what the cost. I think that's great. Uh, do you have any final shout outs? Uh, just two new listeners that I would shout out. Uh, I think from the last episode, they one is Thomas Tew, mm -hmm. and the other was Finn Gamer. Um, I'm sure it's Finn a, Gamer. I'm sure it's a username, but Finn Gamer, one nice. word. Okay. Um, but shout out to the both of you, and thank you for checking us out or listening before. I, I don't know, but we we appreciate it. Do you have any shout outs? Nope, I don't think I have any new ones that I haven't said already. So Fantastic. So guys, with that, thank you so much for joining us in the adventure this week. Thanks for joining us for the, this two-part series. I know it can be kind of long, but this is a great show. If you want to follow us, make sure you do so. Facebook, The Christ and Culture. You can find us on Twitter, at On the Adventure 2. We don't have our own Twitters because we're not huge on social media. No. But find us on the podcast Twitter, and we will we'll reach out to you there. Uh, you can also find us at our website, which is thechristinculture.com. We have blogs. You can find some of our videos there as well as different resources. If you want to learn more about how to do the thing that we do on the show, uh, the TCIC thing as we, we call it here. If this is something that you're interested in and you want to support us in a special way, we are looking to grow and improve this podcast, but that all costs money. So if you want to support us as one of our Patreon patrons, you can go to patreon.com backslash the Christ and culture and become one of our patrons. And for a couple dollars a month, you can support us. And in return, we'll give you bonus content. And depending on which tier, you'll get some of our merch as well. So go check that out. And we appreciate the support. Also, don't forget to like, subscribe, leave reviews, all that kind of stuff on whatever you're listening to. It's a huge benefit for us and helps us reach more people. And it only takes you a couple seconds. So please, please, please give us a shot there. And with that, thank you for joining us in the adventure. And we'll see you guys next week. Bye.
asked him if he was going to be mad because we've been trying to go together for a while. What, you've never been? I've never been. I feel like that's the city I know. in Texas. <laughs> I know.